and I, 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 I want to tell you a story, uh, uh, and I change the title slightly, uh, and there are some new ideas uh, which have been integrating uh, out of our five different themes in the last in the last few weeks yeah? because we are very active in implementing our strategy and in the course of implementing our strategy you have new ideas i, I want to begin uh, by asking uh, i wish i can see your face but i can't uh, why are we here today right uh, how are we united of course we're united because uh, you're an actual science uh, degree in uh, our love mathematics in primary college and i'm the president of the ifoa and we are a common ground, a common ground, and I've talked to actuaries throughout the world, is that we believe we have a capability in mathematics relative to our cohort. Uh, and by that we mean that we are going to be a Pascal or a Gauss of our generation. Um, by that I mean that in our respective schools, uh, whether you are from Zimbabwe, England or Malaysia, they're probably the top three or four students and your, your, your career advisor, your career advisor told you that, that you are quite good at mathematics, you may want to consider a career in actual science. And you, you are not so pure a mathematician that you wanted to work in pure mathematics, nor did you want to go into the physical stuff like engineering. And some of you might go to computer science. You want to work in something practical. And, and many of you are also attracted to a rewarding career. And that, that story applies to all the successful actuaries, 99% of the successful actuaries I spoke to uh, or they enunciate themselves. It was a career or a teacher and none of you say that I want to work in a pension fund or I want to work in a life insurance company because they are symbolic of a fairly boring institutions for a person who is certain things. But you want to use the mathematics to solve practical solutions and to have a rewarding career and, and for Asians in particular, uh, rewarding career is a, is a big deal. And I suspect it applies to all cultures. Yeah? So that is my starting point. I don't think there will be many who will dispute that. Uh, uh, so to apply mathematics in a practical way into a rewarding career as a fundable uh, motive uh, of, our, of our profession, which is very unlike accountants, and, and accountants are great people, or MBAs, or, or masters uh, of uh, chartered financial analysts might have some overlap with us, uh, but they're not as old as us, uh, and, and all that. Yeah. So, so that's that. But I want to take you back uh, even further. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm not about to give you a lecture uh, in the history uh, history of mathematics, although that is very interesting in itself. Uh, pure, uh, pure actuaries probably begin as John Grant, the Englishman in 1620 to 1634. That is on the bottom of the first column. Uh, but the lineage on, on probabilities and those theory goes back to Pascal, the French, the great French uh, mathematician and, and Pierre Fermat, which all of you know uh, by being in 36 and uh, uh, and through their correspondence in trying to understand probability. Uh, De Moray is a French guy, but lived in England, migrated to UK. Uh, I, he translated to expectations, and John Grant began to apply views of mortality. Uh, views of mortality. Uh, so Richard Price and James Dawson, I suppose, are from a lineage point of view. Because for Pascal and Pierre Fermat, probabilities is one of the many things they did because they were in number theory and Pascal was a Catholic, Catholic theologian and his, uh, they are all polymath. So they were, they, were, uh, they were dipping in or playing with probability theory yeah, and helping each other. But the real uh, study uh, of uh, mortality uh, and incidences of uh, Deaths uh, from James Dodson and Edmund Haley. Edmund Haley is a famous astronomer, as you know, and he has wide interests. Uh, Johan de Witt is a Dutch person. And when you cross over to William uh, Morgan, William Morgan is the founder of Equitable Assurances. Huh? But at that time, uh, 
the Institute of Actuaries is not yet formed because it was formed in 1848 and the first president was John Phillipson, which is further down. But they were already working on annuities tables. Uh, you were concerned about annuities and contingent assurances. Yeah? Uh, and Compass was, I can't remember exactly what Compass curve was, but it was fitting uh, an equation into curves, right? But today, data science would make it completely redundant, yeah, because of the data we have in terms of predictability. They would fit curves so that they could predict flexes, yeah, which is the rate of mortality. Uh, Finlayson was the first president of the Institute of Actuary, which is the English Institute, and and uh, the Faculty of Actuaries. Uh, although strangely, Finlayson is a Scotsman, the Faculty of Actuary was formed about six or eight years later. Lord Carr is American, uh, by the time the American universities are not formed, but he's an exceptional man uh, because he went into, a very talented man, went into things like uh, physical biology and public health, demography and all that. Yeah. Uh, but once we go past that, uh, we come into uh, our century, uh, David Wilkie is still alive. He's, uh, I, I choose this name selectively uh, because I want to tell you a story. Uh, no, actually, no, no, Lord Carr should go to Kramer. Kramer is Swedish uh, because uh, 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 my colleague uh, in the uh, Up and Down series. So, from Lord Carr, American, Kramer is uh, Swedish, and the Swiss and uh, Norwegians are famous for their risk theory and statistical analysis. Uh, and and, and the, the giant of the last 100 years, uh, whom I could have met, uh, was the chief actually. Uh, an industrial career, and you should read about him. And he was the president of the Institute of Actuaries uh, uh, in 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 a, in the forties or fifties. I can't remember, but he won his uh, gold medal in 1968, and we should talk about that later. Bernard Benjamin was a specialist in uh, mortality and wrote a lot of books on mortality. David Wilkie, who is still alive, took us to financial economics. And he was great in modeling, even for the AIDS uh, pandemic of 25 years ago. Of course, we have Chris uh, Dakin, uh, uh, which is one of the significant actuaries who's still alive today. So that's a very brief uh, four minutes or five minutes history. But more interestingly, uh, is the periods, right? Is the periods uh, uh, the Pascal and Fermat talking about probability and life contingency? Thomas Bayes was involved. But the formation, there's a least square and central limit theorem. Uh, but equitable life was formed uh, 250, uh, 250, 300 years ago, but of course it collapsed uh, in 2008 or 2009. And, and that sets a, another set, uh, that set a decline of the profession in the last 10 or 50 years in terms of influence. Uh, William Morgan, uh, Price uh, and James Dawson were more into technical modeling. I took a lot of these names from a very good book uh, written by my friend, Craig Turnbull, History of Actual Thoughts. Uh, all these names. Uh, William Morgan uh, is a very important figure in, in this uh, era because he said he really oversaw the growth of equitable life. And equitable life was a big aim in, our, in insurance history in the UK. Um, then we, uh, then after that, uh, there was in those era for the last uh, before 1950, most of the investments were in bonds, guilds, uh, and very little in equity. Uh, but from 30, 40s, 50s onwards, they started investing in equities. And Reddington uh, was pivotal uh, in matching liabilities in a very famous paper in. In 1952, and, and 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 that governs the way we distribute profits, yeah. And I and these were core subjects. And investment link assurance first came in the 80s and 90s, and Wilkie took us to financial economics. But the profession was slow in responding to the changing world uh, of globalization, equity investments, and inflation, yeah. Because since 34, there was huge inflation, and you're always playing catch up. And the way we reserve for our liabilities were, uh, were archaic, uh, were based on net premium valuation, but going all the way to gross premium valuation or bonus reserve valuation was not helpful because it crushes 
everything into present values. You need something more dynamic. Even the dynamic models of Basel II, uh, which we'll come to it later, uh, has its problems, yeah? uh, especially in a world of volatility, uh, in a world of uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Uh, but in the last 30 years, we developed our skills uh, in with profits, uh, in financial economics, and, and, and for those who are advanced enough, uh, and most of you do not have experienced it because you're just studying the techniques. These are about the domains and application. Uh, but if you are a university lecturer or University of London, uh, like Matt and Lloyd is, you know that your pension scheme in terms of reserving and its adequacy is highly open to doubt because of the liability structure of the pensions and the inadequacy of the assets to match them. And that is, remains a, a big problem. Uh, our venture into general insurance was very important for a profession, and I still remember how it was introduced. Uh, Bernard Benjamin, uh, G.B. Hay, uh, Professor Viet uh, took us there. And today, uh, in, when I joined the profession, there are probably uh, no actuaries working in a general insurance business, but there will be thousands in the UK and elsewhere. And there's a whole story about that. Uh, and and risk-based capital is, uh, many of you may not have studied this, but essentially it's a whole set of rules based on neoclassical economics about how to measure risk. Uh, but there are some fundamental problems because it produces uh, unintended effects, uh, as in many systems do. Uh, but that's the story until today. Uh, but in the last 10 years, uh, uh, in 15 years, uh, uh, there is a digital revolution taking place uh, and the fourth industrial revolution taking place, which is not beyond digital in genetics, in behavioral finance, uh, in chemistry, uh, all that. It's going to be fundamentally changing uh, the way we live and work and all professions and all industries will be disrupted, affected, or they'll be given a lot of opportunities. And how do we survive that? It's a 50-year question. Uh, the next 10 or 20, 30 years, whether you are going to be an accountant or MBA or lecturer, uh, the way we do things will change. Yeah? Uh, 